I'm on the line with us is Brian Karam. He is the senior White House correspondent for Playboy magazine, or was uh, for Playboy magazine. It's now defunct. A uh, contributor to Salon.com, host of the Just Ask the Question podcast. And he has a new book out. It's called Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. His website is JustAskTheQuestion.com. And you can tweet him at Brian Karam, K-A-R-E-M. Uh, Brian, welcome to the program. I, I, first of all, I got to say, I, your uh, the piece that you you wrote uh, titled "Requiem for a Dead Bunny" I found absolutely fascinating. I started in radio news in the late 1960s, and I uh, I, I remember many of the times that you're discussing there. Um, but uh, what what do you see in your new book, "Free the Press: The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It"? What do you see as the principal problem that we're facing? And and, and well, let's start there. Well, I, I guess the principal problem we're facing is that for the last 40 years, the government has systemically tried to destroy the free press. And, and I'm talking about from top to bottom, from local to state to federal governments. Um, and there are three things that, at the national level that you look at. It's the elimination of the uh, fairness doctrine and the ability to, you know, tearing down all the walls so that we could buy each other up, the consumption in the news business and the constriction and the consolidation has led to a point where there's twice the number of people on the planet today as on the day that I was born, and there's half the number of reporters in the United States. And I, I give a couple of examples, pointed examples from my own career as to, to how bad it is. And probably the best one to look at is Laredo, Texas, where when I was working down there in the 80s, it was... Um, there were 100,000 people. There were two uh, daily newspapers that printed in English and a couple in uh, Spanish. There were three or four television stations that uh, produced news, a couple or three uh, radio stations that produced news. Today, 35 years later, there's uh, 300,000 people, three times the number of people. There's one newspaper and one television station. So there's your problem in a nutshell with uh, – the entire uh, journalism world today. There's fewer of us, and because of constriction, uh, we're, uh, the institutional knowledge is just gone, and uh, that uh, that has led to, uh, look, at people on the right or the left and the middle, they all say, hey, there's something wrong with the press. Some people say, hey, we're, we're tilted to the right. Some people say, hey, we're, we're liberally biased, and we're not. We're, we're biased towards money. And when journalism becomes intertwined with capitalism, and I'm, I'm a happy capitalist, uh, buy as many copies of my book as you want, but <laughs> when, when you tie journalism to capitalism, then what you end up with is news that you want to read rather than news that you need to yeah. hear or read. I, I would identify, and I lived through this, I mean, in 69, in seven, well, for seven years, I worked in the newsroom right up until 76, uh, at uh, WITL in Lansing, Michigan, and uh, you know there were a bunch of us who worked there. Uh, we had the Fairness Doctrine at that time, which required us to do local news. I mean, it didn't explicitly require that, but it required programming in the public interest, and everybody interpreted that to mean you did local news. Every station, I worked at WITL, I worked at WVIC, I worked at WJIM, I worked at WJIM-TV, um, I, I worked at WFMK, I worked at five or six of the, of the six or seven stations in Lansing. And in every one, we had a newsroom, right? And and so the the the, the and none of and I'm guessing now, and I uh, but talking to my brothers who still live in Lansing, um, you know, they're all basically just owned by big chains, and they're just carrying network news now. Um, yeah. So so it seems to me like there are three kind of milestones in this path. 1983, Ronald Reagan instructed the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission to stop enforcing our anti-monopoly laws. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1891, the, the Clayton Act of the 1927, I think it was, the uh, 1956 or 57 uh, antitrust law. And that set the stage for what was going to come. Then in, 80, and then in 87, he ended uh, enforcement of the Fairness Doctrine. It didn't get removed from the law until Barack Obama did it during his presidency, but he, he stopped enforcement of it. And as a consequence, you know, we had this uh, change, shall we say, in the need for news to, in order to get your license renewed for radio and television stations. And then in 1996, Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 96, which ended ownership limits. 
And yeah. now we've got this perfect storm as a consequence of these three decisions. Are there other points in time that you would identify? Do you agree with my three? Oh, yeah, I, I, I bring those up in the book. I, I leave out the Sherman Act and all that. because I talk about how um, chain store journalism has destroyed journalism. And I refer to H.L. Mencken, who said the same thing 100 years ago. I refer. I don't refer to them by name because I, I concentrate more on the on this side of it, what we saw in the business as we worked through it. But yes, I name those. And the other thing I would point to is the uh, the Patriot Act. Um, the Patriot Act helped destroy uh, journalism in ways that are still being measured today. How? And well, one of if you look at the book, one of the things that the Patriot Act did was it was a piece of it was a piece of legislation that was. Uh, parts of other legislation that had already been turned down by Congress and hadn't been passed right. because it gave um, untold powers to those in, in power, particularly uh, to law enforcement. And one of the things that it allowed was when you talk about 1983 and you talk about Reagan, one of the things that he did was he also had members of government pretend to be reporters and show up at, at you know, at, at events pretending to be reporters. And that wasn't, we, we couldn't stand that for that then. And we, we got upset about it, but the ability to go in and hack newspapers and, and, and what happened was when the Patriot Act went into effect, it gave government untold power to go after newspapers and television stations and journalists. And so it blew up whistleblowers basically. Yes. And that was led to the espionage act being used by, Barack Obama more times than any other president ever used it to go after whistleblowers. So in the book, I talk about all of the events that you talked about, as well as as the um, as well as the Patriot Act. But one of the things that I mentioned that is very that's almost it has flown under the radar for the most part is to be for journalism to exist. The backbone of journalism is community journalism, and there are vast information and news deserts in this country i think it's a thousand of them where there are no local there's no local reporting done at all and that's because the state and local governments over the last 40 years have helped destroy transparency and the bottom line for some smaller publishers newspaper ads such as public notice and public service ads where you advertise a State sales. You advertise what the government is doing. This meeting is going on Wednesday at seven o'clock. Here's the agenda. Things like that have been eliminated in the in the, according to government and the needs to cut costs. But what right. it's really done is cut the profits and cut the uh, uh, ability of newspapers to local newspapers to survive. Right. These were essentially profit, subsidies. Yes, they, it was, and, and it was a subsidy, but it was a well needed subsidy because. Community newspapers and those public service ads help build communities. There, uh, you talk to, and I have talked to uh, lawyers, salesmen, who would look at these ads and go, okay, this is state sales here. Here's a client. I need to call them up. Or you would see uh, an ad about, uh, you know, what was going on in the government. You go, hey, this piece of property needs to be, you know, fixed. Or, hey, this street needs to be paved. Or, hey, this is where fresh water is. At the national level, we all may disagree. There's left and right, but everybody, everybody has more in common than they have different from one another. Right. We all want the street lights to work. We all want power in our homes. We all want water, fresh water. We all want the paved streets. It, all of these things that we have in common, it, it, we no longer report on. And those community newspapers built communities and not and did not divide them. Yeah. And coincidentally, and probably more importantly to the national news, which they which we refuse to see, is that most national stories have their beginnings in uh, local community news. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you. Brian, forgive the interruption. I'm looking at the clock here, and i got a hard break coming in, in, a, in about two minutes. Um, okay. So let's get to solutions. It seems to me like uh, rolling back the provisions of the 96 Telecommunications Act that ended ownership limits and going back to you cannot own, you know, one company can't own 1,000 radio stations uh, any longer, for example, or one company can't own over 200 yeah. television stations would be a good start. That's in that book. Yeah, that's in the book. We're I talking about the book, by the way, is Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It by Brian Karam, who's my guest. Excuse me, Brian. 
That's all right. No, and I thank you for plugging the book. (laughs) But in addition to that, I think you need to reinstitute the Fairness Doctrine and make it applicable across the Internet. You can do that. I think the president needs to have a Blue Ribbon Commission and panel one with local and community newspapers as well as uh, radio stations, television stations, and networks, and find a way to make that work. You need to subsidize newspapers and radio and television again. It would be nice. For example, if when you fill out your taxes every year, which is many of us are beginning to do, that you got $100 back on your taxes, for example, if you could prove that you subscribe to a local newspaper. What a concept. Hmm. I, I think you also need to have a, a reporter shield law national. Well, shield law. Hang, hang, I, I'm with you on the shield law, but more than half of all the local newspapers in the United States are now owned by hedge funds. Yes, and that's a big How problem. do we stop? <laughs> None of us want to subsidize that's, hedge funds. That is the most controversial thing in my book, I think, is or the thing that gets the most pushback, but you have got to use antitrust legislation, bust up the media oh, monopoly, and, and limit ownership as we tried to do in the early 80s. We tried to limit newspaper ownership to 20, and we don't have that ability anymore, and we have gutted journalism and for vulture funds. I don't even call them venture capital. They're vulture capital. And that's what's caused the biggest problem in, in newspapers there. Yeah, when, when Sean and I were working, I was doing this show out of the studios of KPOJ here in Portland uh, back, what, 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, a local station is a local Clear Channel pod. And Mitt Romney's company bought out Clear Channel. And we went in one year from, what, 20 people in the newsroom, Sean? In the neighborhood of 20 people? To two. Yeah. Well, there's newspapers today that don't even have copy editors. Right. How can you call well, the, you know, the difference between there's the difference between bloggers and newspapers almost doesn't exist anymore. I don't think you can call yourself a journalist unless you've got a, at least a copy editor over you look and go, hey, that's BS. Hey, you need to look at that. Yeah, I'm with you. Brian Karam is the author. The book is Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. The website, justaskthequestion.com. Brian Karam, K-A-R-E-M over on Twitter. Brian, thanks for dropping by and thanks for writing this book. Thank you.